make sure to give my dad a five star review. Get, make sure to like and subscribe to his YouTube. Thank, thank you for listening and enjoy the, the show. show. <laughs> Christian nationalism is probably the biggest threat to democracy, but also the church today. And one of the reasons it's such a big threat to the church, and there are many, is people look at Christianity and say, wait, that's who you guys are? The ones who want to burn down the Capitol and attack FBI offices and shoot up grocery stores over a great replacement conspiracy theories? I, I don't, that's Jesus. I don't want that Jesus. Hey, welcome back, Faithful Politics listeners and viewers. If you're watching us on our YouTube channel, I am your political host, Will Wright, and I'm joined by your faithful host, Josh Bertram. What's up, Josh? What's going on, Will? Good to be here. And today we have with us the Reverend Nathan Ensel. He's the executive director of Faithful America, the largest online community of grassroots Christians, putting faith into action for love and social justice and against the religious right as a leader, expert, uh, as a leading expert, sorry, on Christian resistance to white Christian nationalism and MAGA's crypto fascism. Reverend Nathan's writing has appeared in Time, Newsweek, NBC News, The Daily Beast, Red Letter Christians, Religious News Service, and more. And we are just so thrilled to finally have him on our show. So welcome to the program, Reverend. Thank you. God bless. I'm, I'm honored by your invitation. Yeah. Th- yes, uh, Welcome. So, so t- tell us a little bit more. I, I, I probably didn't do a, a very good job talking about what Faithful America um, is. So, so maybe you can give us, you know, the, the elevator pitch of what Faithful America is all about. Yeah, Faithful America, like you said, largest online community of Christians putting faith into action for love and social justice. Uh, we were founded in 2004, originally by the National Council of Churches and a group of activists, but we're a completely independent organization now with over 200,000 members lay and ordained, representing every major Christian tradition and denomination in the country, in all 50 states, D.C. and Puerto Rico, taking action online. So petitions, social media, call alerts, uh, webinars, sometimes in-person events. And we're we're largely speaking out to resist what we see as the twisting of our faith uh, for discrimination, especially in politics, and as well as in the church. But we're also speaking out about the things we're for, taking action for things we believe represent love, equality, dignity, and various forms of justice, all rooted in the teachings of Jesus Christ. So folks wow. can join us and take action with us at faithfulamerica.org. <laughs> that, that's awesome. And like, Dude, well, that was a great elevator pitch, I gotta yeah. say. I, yeah. I just gave one to Will myself, and yours was like five times better than mine. I've been working on it. It wasn't always so short. My comms people will tell you. <laughs> so, so what, 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 what kinds of things specifically um, are, are, are the folks over at Faithful America doing? Sure. Well, I'm really excited about a brand new victory we just had. Uh, Fisher Price. I, I have a preschool daughter myself, so this is, this is personal. Fisher Price, which is now a brand of Mattel, sells a really cute, beautiful nativity scene We actually from, from the Little People line. We have one in my house. And the characters, as particularly the Holy Family, are super white. Little blonde, white baby Jesus, blue eyes. Not at all like the child born into occupied territory, occupied by the Romans to side with the poor, uh, likely a person of color. I don't think Fisher Price means anything by this, but they're reinforcing the medieval European stereotype of a white Jesus that tells us Jesus is just like you rather than, hey, Jesus calls you to love and be with the poor. We sent Fisher Price a letter calling them out on this privately, going to them directly first. They were fairly receptive, but also said, you're never going to hear from us on this again. We're either going to change it or we're not, but you make some good points. Thank you. So after that, about 15,000, maybe 17,000 Faithful American members signed petitions and sent letters to Fisher Price asking them to change this, saying, we, we've seen you diversify the Barbie line. We know you're not trying to reinforce white supremacy, but look at all these theologians like Anthea Butler and James Martin who say that's exactly what you're doing. Please change it. We just found out about a month ago on Fisher Price website, they have a new line of the nativity scene for kids, the little people crush, and it's got a... a much less clear, what clearly white, more racially ambiguous nice. family. Not going to alienate doing? anybody. Hmm? Yeah, we, we approached them with the spirit of love. You know, we, we were public about it. We got some some media pressure on on Fisher Price at the same time, but we didn't vilify them over it. So we're really excited, and and I think you know Mattel or Fisher Price is listening. We're very grateful, and we thank them for making this change. 
we're also frequently calling out the Reawaken America Tour. I know you've had its organizer, Clay Clark, on the podcast. We Everywhere this Christian nationalist uh, event with Michael Flynn and his pastor pals go, usually mega churches, sometimes Trump resorts, we organize local pastors to speak out and say, this doesn't represent our faith. We're not saying that it's not a Christian event, but let's not portray it as the voice of Christians. It's not Democrats, liberals versus Christians. It's Christians disagreeing over these matters. And we change the tenor of the local press coverage Michael Flynn gets. We're asking a number of venues in the border states not to host Franklin Graham's upcoming tour because he uses uh, his father's image from Billy Graham and the, the legitimately good work of Samaritan's Purse to mask a very far right and increasingly conspiratorial political agenda that we would argue really hurts people. So we use all these online tactics and tools to run these campaigns. We're also very involved on a number of Roman Catholic matters. I, I'm an Episcopal priest, but a plurality of our members are Roman Catholic, and they're asking us to support Pope Francis, to call out bishops like Bishop Strickland in Texas, who went to stop the steel events, uh, really opposed Q vaccines, uh, retweeted some QAnon accounts. Folks want us to push these bishops and hold them accountable to the words of Pope Francis. So we've done a lot in that regard as well. Man, that's really amazing, dude. Thank you for all the work that you're doing to try to bring some sanity back into our country and back into uh, our evangelical world, our Christian world, you know. I, the lines between evangelical and Catholic and Episcopal um, are blurring more and more and more in my mind. It's just people that know God, love Jesus, have his, you know, have his place um, at, uh, and his heart in their minds as they're moving forward. I, I think that is so important. And that's not to say that there isn't a, you know, that that evangelical, the term, isn't an important term that needs to be defined carefully and that it can have obviously very negative connotations and and does, is a group, a categorization that shows us some pretty significant trends that some people I know find very, very concerning. And I guess that's kind of more of my question because I have a lot of friends. I, I've said this so much. That sounded so arrogant. I have a lot of friends. What I mean is I have a lot of friends that f that feel a certain way about politics that is uh, that is is conservative. Some would even define it very far right, you know. And and I know for each person that spectrum is just a little bit different when we're trying to figure it out, especially when it's someone that we love and care for, right? That has these kinds of thinking and this mindset and these opinions. And when I talk to my friends, so often it's kind of like, hey, you know, I hear the word Christian nationalism, and I think, hey, you know what? Um, I, uh, you know, it, it's not really all that bad. I'm not really sure what I'm hearing. That's all that wrong. It just sounds like they're kind of trying to restore sanity to the world. It's just kind of like they're trying to make sure that, you know, uh, that we're blessed by God. Who doesn't want to be blessed by God? You know, I was at a recent event and I'm not even going to name it. Right. But I was at this recent event. I look it up and they're selling shirts. And one of them says, I'm 1717, no, 1776% sure that you're not going to take my guns. And then another one said, M not, you know, my God, my country, my guns, or what, you know, whatever it is, or in that list or in that order, people feel very strongly about this. And in order to really get a lot of traction, yes, you're going to need to get, you know, a large contingency of people that really are, are passionate about what's going on. And as you clearly have 200,000 people. That's amazing. 200,000 ministers, right? Or clergy or some kind of, maybe I misheard that. Well, you can correct me on all that just in a moment. I'll let you speak. I promise. But what I was just saying, it was like, why convince? I, I'm already pretty convinced. It won't take much to convince me. I don't think of the, of the concern and danger. Convince some other people that are much more difficult to convince than I would be that it's dangerous and that we should not be in support of something like Christian nationalism. Yeah. Yeah, Faithful America has over 200,000 members, and, and maybe 10% of them are ministers, they're all Christians. But that's one of Thank our real folks. Thank you for folks. that clarification. People in the news, you know, uh, going directly to, to the grassroots, including ministers. Uh, I, let me back up, because I love where you started. I, I was surprised, but I loved it when you said that um, you see like the words Catholic, Episcopal, Evangelical, the, the lines blurring. 
because I worry sometimes our lines are hardening and we're getting more division. I think these words are important because Christianity, with what, 2 billion people around the globe, is so diverse. And we act like it's this monolithic religion with the Christian view, uh, you know, the Christian post, when, when, and it's always representing one tiny sliver. So uh, I, I've always been Episcopalian, but I hung out in all the evangelical fellowships in college. I was one of like two people who did both. But I, you know, I go to conventions and gatherings, and I always find myself hanging out with the more progressive evangelical corner rather than the more Episcopal liturgical corner. So I, I, Rich Mullins to the end. So I, I love, I just really loved what you said. Um, yeah, Christian nationalism. Those words can sound adenine, neutral, even positive. Christianity is good. I love my nation. Well, why is that a bad thing? And I would say, I find that interesting because we don't have that same reaction when we hear the phrase white nationalism. But it's the same word, nationalism. Every now and then I meet someone who says, I'm white, I'm patriotic, why is that a problem? But most people understand that means you're trying to create a white nation at the expense of non-white people, calling them un-American, and that's a bad thing. Nationalism plays the same role in the phrase Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism is the label we've put on an ideology that says America should be a Christian nation, a place where Christians get special legal rights and where the American identity and the Christian identity, usually a specific form of conservative Christian Chris, uh, conservative Christian identity, are merged, where the American and Christian identities are merged. And that comes at the expense of the legal rights of non-Christians. So it's inherent, inherently anti-Semitic, anti-Muslim, anti-Indigenous, other things along those nature. It's basically theocracy. It's saying that the law should be based not on the common good or on democracy or even on the Constitution, but on the Bible, on a very particular interpretation of the Bible. Now, my God, my country, my family, absolutely. My children, my neighbors, but that's very different than saying these are all the same thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Christian nationalists tend to oppose, I'm sorry, I should not use the phrase Christian nationalists, Adherents of Christian nationalism and Christian nationalist leaders tend to say there is no separation of church and state. So often when I describe Christian nationalism, that's what people say. What about the separation of church and state? Christian nationalism is not a religion. It's a political ideology that is seeking power for usually conservative, usually white, usually evangelical, but not always, sometimes Catholic Christians, saying that they should have all the power that God wants this to be a Christian nation, that God ordained their candidates, which is why we know Donald Trump won the election. It was impossible for him to lose. So if he did lose, it was fraud. He was God's candidate. So he clearly won. And because this is a divine mission, we can use any means necessary to take the power back, including political violence. Now, I think January 6th. Now, I think that most people, when they hear that phrase Christian nationalism, that's not where the mind goes. The mind, we could have done a better job naming this ideology. But it is an ideology of power and of leadership, a leader-driven movement seeking basically theocracy. And we see that in laws that strip rights away from folks like LGBTQ Americans, uh, because that's not what my God says we should be doing. Well, it's one thing to do that in your church, but it's another thing to say the laws of the country must be based on my church. Or saying we must have God in schools, we must bring prayer back into schools, uh, because there's no separation of church and state. And that disrespects the rights of anyone who wouldn't share that prayer, not just students who feel pressured, even if they're allowed to opt out, feel pressured to participate, but the teachers were asking to lead these moments. I'll stop there, but I could go on and on. No, I I, I think that that's, that's uh, pretty amazing. And it's almost like uh, lately I've been sort of re re racking how I think about separation of church and state. Cause it, cause like when we, when we talk about church, like we're, we're really talking about the Christian church, right? So like it's, there's no separation between Christianity and the state. Um, and that's, that's less ambiguous, right? <laughs> because, uh, for those that, that don't want that, um, separation, um, they wouldn't feel the same way if it was another religion. Right. Um, so, um, but, but, but go, going back to sort of the, the, the effect on Christian nationalism kind of within like Christians in, in the country, like how, like, how does it, how does it 
intertwined? Like what areas does Christian nationalism intertwine? And then what areas does it like conflict with a lot of the core teachings of Christianity? Um, Because I think that that's that's one area where I feel, you know, people are going to latch on to this ideology because they're like, oh, well, the person said in the Bible, you know, X, Y or Z, Um, you know, but then others, specifically non-believers are like, you know, yeah, no, my understanding of what Christianity is, is not what I see on Fox News. Yeah. Um, So. So can I add you something real quick? Well, the Mm -hmm. idea like that many people would consider like the Second Amendment or First Amendment or 14th Amendment or 13th Amendment, right? Of course, as more materially significant and as more, you know, actually having some kind of a real effect on their life than the Ten Commandments. And I think that, like, how can we start to make that shift as Christians understanding what that means and how maybe the Second Amendment, even though I'm a big gun guy, the Second Amendment, how that might not necessarily be in harmony with all the teachings of Christ. It's been a long time since I went shooting. Uh, I'm, I'm not a, I'm, I'm a big uh, gun reform and gun control guy and a big gun guy all at the same time. I um, him. Me too. Yeah, and, and you know, the Ten Commandments and more than that, the Golden Rule, the Gospels should be what? comes first for us as as Christians. And I don't believe that that clashes in any way with following the Constitution and honoring the amendments. Um, Well, that's a a really great question. I think that, obviously, I believe, based on what I've already said today about January 6th, Three Wake in America, Franklin Graham, I think that Christian nationalism mostly conflicts with Christianity. At the same time, there are a couple places where it can really seem to intertwine, and I think it's helpful to be understanding of that and and for folks who see that and follow that. The first thing that comes to mind is the number of places in the Bible, mainly the Old Testament, where we do see religious nations, not Christian nations. This is before Christ or before Jesus anyway, but uh, God blessing a people who form a nation out of that blessing. But that's not a nation state as we understand it today. It's a very ancient, different form of governing in in, in more uh, nomadic and tribal societies. By the time we get to Jesus and and also to Paul, we don't see any talk of forming a religious nation. Jesus never said Pontius Pilate has to become Jewish, as Jesus was Jewish, or, or Christian. We don't see him, when Roman centurions came to Jesus to say, would you heal my daughter? Jesus didn't say, hold on, are you going to come Jewish first? Or hold on, are you a Christian with my disciples? He didn't say, I need you to go and change Rome and change the religion of Rome. We've got to change the state. It had nothing to do with the nature of the state. And Paul was was no different. So it's easy to look at the Bible and think it's calling us to form a religious nation, which in our context would be a Christian nation. But really, those early Christians for for 400 years were trying to build a counterculture over and and against the state, but not inside or changing the state. That didn't change until you get first Emperor Constantine, who brought Christianity into the light, and then successive emperors who made it the official religion of the empire and started to corrupt it. Suddenly, it wasn't about loving your neighbor. It was about gaining power, ostensibly to use that power to love your neighbor. But more and more, was just power was the only thing in focus. So I understand how we can look at the Bible and, and see this call to power and think that that does intertwine with our faith. But man, in Luke 4, Satan took Jesus out to the wilderness and said, I'll give you complete political authority. And Jesus said, no, thank you. That that clashes with following God. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, it's it's interesting. So I'm I, I just started reading um, Greg Boyd's book, uh, Myth of a, of a Christian Religion. Uh, we, we had him on the show to talk about his book, Christ, uh, Myth of a Christian Nation, which was amazing. Um but in his in his book, uh, Myth of a Christian Religion, he talks about how whenever people of Christ come into political power, it never ends well. And then he like cites all these different examples, you know, and I'm just like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But 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 I but I'm curious, like, how, how do we get to like this point where, you know, we are talking about Christian nationalism so, so often. So, you know, it, it seems so often, I don't know, maybe, maybe this has always kind of been, been there, but I mean, are there, are there 
telltale signs that sort of the lay observer could could identify and point out that something is Christian Christian nationalist, you know, kind of in in design or in structure, because uh, it always it from my viewpoint, I, and I think I heard a conservative commentator say this and actually maybe it may have been Roger Stone. I don't know. But but but, but essentially he said, you know, the left calls anything they don't like about Christians Christian nationalism. Um, and to some degree, it's like I I can see how that could happen if if you're not trained or understand this stuff. So so how how can you spot a Christian nationalist? Uh, is it OK to swear on the podcast? I hope so. Sure. Please Roger, do. Stone, Roger Stone recently <laughs> tweeted that uh, out of the blue one night, like midnight, he tweeted Nathan Imsel is such a blasphemous asshole. And then the <laughs> Then he deletes the tweet about 20 minutes later. Did you get a picture but, of it? Uh, I did. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. I, I would like to uh, thank Mr. Stone for the fundraising email that went out containing that picture. That's uh, amazing. <laughs> but, uh, Any news was, is good. Press. <laughs> whether it was Stone or not who, who said that, that the left labels anything they don't like Christian nationalism, I, I do worry about that, actually. Um you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty progressive, but no one is perfect. And I get things wrong. My friends on the left get things wrong. And and I do worry about uh, a little bit overuse of that term to describe anything conservative. Faithful America often works about things within the church as well as within in the, the country and the, and the uh, politics. We're rooted in our faith. And when we're dealing with things in the church, it has nothing to do with Christian nationalism. It's just, it's just theology and loving and, and, and as Christians talking to Christians, not about the law, but about behavior. Uh, and we don't want to overuse the phrase. It's a great question. How do you identify Christian nationalism? The the academics and the sociologists who came up with that phrase, who measure it, who identify it, use a spectrum. They say there's no such thing as yes, Christian nationalist or no Christian nationalist. It's how Christian nationalist is it? And, and they ask a, different pollsters use different questions, but questions like, do you believe the U.S. should be a Christian nation? Do you believe our law should be based on the Bible? Uh, do you believe that Christians should should be the only citizens? Uh, do you believe this law, that law? And then how how firmly do you believe it? You know, strongly inclined, less inclined, and they get this spectrum. But in practical everyday terms, how to see that? I think that there are some key phrases like Christian nation. When we hear that phrase, that that is Christian nationalist. We hear it a lot. It, 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 we've heard that phrase for decades. Another one, surprisingly, is Judeo Christian values. I never, almost never hear Jewish leaders use that phrase. Uh, William Barr, the former attorney general, gave this big speech at Notre Dame University, law, well, it's law school a few years back, talking about the importance of Judeo-Christian traditions to America. And every single scripture and piece of history he cited was only on the Christian half. So that tends to be a way of intentionally or not trying to, to religion wash things and, and pull things uh, into a direction that favors the speaker. We can look specifically at laws. What laws are someone advocating and what is their reasoning for those laws? Most of the time, most teachings uh, against LGBTQ persons or LGBTQ activity, same-sex relationships are rooted in religion. Most, not all, but most teachings uh, for outlawing abortion are rooted in religion. That one's a little more complicated, I'll acknowledge. But when someone is arguing to take rights away from other American communities, is it rooted in religion or is it 90% of the people who agree with that rooting their views in religion? Then those laws are likely theocratic and theocracy is a religious nation, in our case, Christian nation, Christian nationalism. So keep an eye out for those laws that are rooted in religion, uh, that, that are trying to push religion on others. Our political involvement as, as people of faith, should be about love. And, and love is never coercive, and coercion is never loving. So I think that's the place to look. And I would also, you know, if it sounds like I'm pointing a finger more at conservative laws here, I, I would say to my fellow liberals, well, my fellow Episcopalians, there's a church in Washington, D.C., very near the White House, actually has pretty progressive sermons. A lot of them have traditionally been rooted in liberation theology. And yet every president has worshipped at this church, and they're very proud of that fact. So their pew kneelers all bear the, the seal of the president and the names of the different presidents of the United States right there in the sanctuary. Uh, that's a problem to me. <laughs> Plenty of churches will have the American flag right in the church, progressive and liberal churches. 
Jesus was teaching 1776. He was born 1776 years before the United States was as a country. One day, like every other nation, the U.S. will fall. The church will remain. Christianity will remain. We as Christians need to speak truth to power, not bring the flag of power into our sanctuary. And I'm an Episcopal priest. Our Book of Common Prayer has a prayer for the 4th of July that talks about uh, the, the founding fathers following God and doing God's bidding. There are other better prayers in the book for prayers for the nation that I use on that day. These things, the flag and the church, these prayers, these phrases, these punilers, they aren't the same as storming the Capitol after a prayer rally under the Christian flag. They they aren't the same as spreading conspiracy theories that, that seize power or get people killed. But they get us a little bit too used to the rhetoric that does lead to that violence, that does lead to restricting rights, closing polling places, all those things. And so we have to watch out for it in our own communities too. And that that's well said. I appreciate that response and and, and your words, Reverend. I, I, I truly do. I I'm a really big fan of the Roman Empire. Maybe not fan. That's a wrong thing. I'm very interested in the Roman. How often do you think Empire? about the I Roman Empire? I think about it every day. <laughs> I know. I was going to start with that, but I wanted to. You know, I. I, I I just wanted to give that line to you so I could, you know, be able to respond to it. And, and, but I do, I think about it actually probably too much. And I was reading a book. It's the uh, DK, like they, it's an Eng English publisher uh, in England and they make a lot of like really comprehensive, like visual, um, you know, encyclopedias and stuff like that. And so they had, this uh, this book about the Roman Empire, and there's this one picture in one of the pages talking about power and talking about Senate, the Senate, and how that worked during the Republic and everything. And there are these blue, massive blue walls, and it's like these are the Senate doors from the Republic. And guess where they were? At the Vatican, like these doors that entered into this cathedral and like the Vatican and these massive thousands of years old. And it's funny because like, and I'm sure that if they had, right, the cross of Jesus Christ, it would have been placed up there and people would have been bringing it as to a shrine and it would have had so much. I'm, I'm actually glad we didn't really uh, recover it because we would have idolized it and worshipped it and made it a shrine countless times. We already did that. We would have done it like, you know, even more exponentially more. But I think about the power yeah. and and the, the lust for power, right? But at one sense, though, the church or religion, if you want to say it, and state have always been mixed. And, and I'll be honest, I don't think they'll ever not be mixed. The question is, to what extent are they influencing each other? And how much power does one have over the other? Because I don't think we'll get rid of religion. I'm actually con absolutely convinced we won't. Um, you, you get rid of Christianity, okay, you'll never get rid of religion. We are built as belief in like in machines if you're an atheist and we're built, right, or, or have that kind of view, um, but we're built to believe. And when you're talking about your efforts, I can't help but think that like, yes, this is an organization and I really love what you guys are doing. This is positive, but this is an organization that's trying to use influence their own kind of influence, right? And power to do what? To try to convince our government to do something different or the people to vote into our government to do something different than what's being done right now. And I'm wondering what is the difference fundamentally between the two? What's the difference necessarily between you and a Christian nationalist? And I'm not saying this as like, um, I hope you're not hearing this in a like uh, any kind of like aggressive way. What I'm trying to say is help me understand and the people are asking and understand like what is the difference because it seems like maybe both are trying to use their own influence to make the government look like what they want it to look like or think it should look like i i think that's a great question to work backwards i think what you want the government to look like matters are you trying to build a government 
of yourself and those just like you, for yourself and those just like mm. you, or for everyone. I think everyone is is God's child, whether they know it or not, whether they believe it or not, whether they agree with me about that or yeah, not. God created all of us. We're all God's children. And in a democracy or a democratic republic, uh, the government is and must remain for all people of all races, of all uh, sexual orientations and gender identities, of all genders, and yes, of all faiths. And so to what end are you using power? Are you pursuing power? But let me back up from there for a minute to say there is a big difference between a separation of church and state, which I believe in, and the separation of faith and politics. People of faith, Christians especially, but but all people of faith, should absolutely be involved in politics. I had a law professor. I'm not a lawyer, but I took well a couple- said. Well said. That's good. That's good. Thank you. I took a couple of classes at law school, and there was a law professor who said, politics, it, the, the, word, the, the root word of politics is polis, the Greek word for people. Politics is simply the art of how we live together as people. And doesn't faith have a lot to say about how we live together? Absolutely. Isn't the whole point of love thy neighbor? So you can't not you can't set your faith aside when you're getting involved in politics, nor should you. The question is, how do you use your faith? Meanwhile, the church and the state are institutions. When a Christian gets involved, that's as an individual, as a citizen. The church they are not an institution. The church is an institution. The church should not be trying to decide who runs the government. And in exchange, the government doesn't tax the churches. I think that's an important and appropriate relationship that protects both the church and democracy. Yeah, agreed. I think churches can get involved in policy. I think they should get involved in policy in a way that helps and loves their communities and their neighbors. But that's different than getting involved in candidates and elections which is really what the separation of church and state means. And really, it's the separation of church and elections more than than state, because it's good to say this is what we believe and what we want our community to look like, if that's something that helps everyone. And so I'm, I know Tony Perkins loves to say the phrase Christian nationalism was invented by liberals as a way to scare Christians not to be involved in politics. And yet most of the biggest opponents of Christian nationalism are Christians. The heads of the ELCA Lutherans and the Episcopal Church and the United Church of Christ, all those presiding bishops and denominational leaders have endorsed the initiative Christians Against Christian Nationalism. Faithful America has 200,000 Christian members uh, working against Christian nationalism because it's a corruption of our faith. That doesn't mean, and yet we are involved in politics at the same time. So really it's Tony Perkins who is, is trying to say the liberals are not Christian and they're hypocrites and Christians should be involved in politics, but only as conservative. No, Christians should be in politics, but not in ways that force our religion on others. Look to Jimmy Carter as a model of how to do that. And I'm not saying you got to be liberal like him, but you know, he was liberal before we had all these culture wars. So it has nothing to do with prayer in school. Just look at the way he didn't say this is what God wants, but he prayed. He, he talked about honesty. Half the time Jesus told us how to treat people, he didn't say this is what God wants you to do. He just said, this is me. Don't do that. Right? When he gave us these parables, he just said, wow, wasn't, wasn't that landowner kind of mean? And that's wrong. Don't do that. So we don't always have to invoke faith when we're invoking the values Jesus taught us. At the end of the day, is it about love or is it about coercion? I'm curious uh, on your thoughts about when you think, um, you know, Christian nationalism has, I don't, I don't know what the right word is, like solidified or or become like what it is today i mean like if there was you know one defining moment in history that you would you would point to um like what 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 would that what would that that be um because because it's interesting like like we've we've spoken to a number of people and some people would say well you know it it goes back to the more majority you know back in the 70s and others is like well it's all about eisenhower how he got he got religion you know and really kind of made it made it sort of more more popularized so so i'm curious on, on your thoughts we, you know just like the sociologists who use a spectrum to define the ideology where are you on that spectrum how harshly mm -hmm. i'm not sure there's a single moment or a single defining period it's, it's a timeline with a number of points along the way that feed into each other it gets stronger along the way certainly the moral majority 
is the and, and the years leading up to that with Phyllis Schlafly and and Falwell segregation lawsuits. That's when the religious right, as we know it, began. And the religious right is not a synonym for Christian nationalism, nor vice versa. But there's a lot of overlap, especially in the Trump years. I think that the uh, crystallization of Dominion theology and the new Apostolic Reformation over the last couple of decades really feeds into the religious right, pulls it in that kind of MAGA and dare I say Christo fascist direction that that really uses nationalism and power. But the scene for that is is set by I wasn't going to say Eisenhower, but I was going to point to that era. I really recommend the book One Nation Under God by the historian Kevin. I think it's pronounced Cruz, Kevin Cruz. That explores the way the uh, Chamber of Commerce and other U.S. businesses got involved, tried to co-opt religion, tried to hire pastors to go out and preach a brand new gospel of low taxes to try and fight communism and bolster their profits. But let's say that didn't come from the pastors that came from the businessmen first who said, I had an idea, let's hire the pastors. And that leads to One Nation Under God and the Pledge and all the Eisenhower era pieces but that started actually in the 30s, not the 50s, and had its wins in the 50s. But you can go back before that, I'd say manifest destiny, especially in the 1880s. But this God wants us to, to go west and take the land from the Indians and settle it. It is our manifest destiny from God. It's this story we tell ourselves to this day about our nation, whether or not we use that, that phrase that it was our destiny uh, code as white people to go west. Because there were already people there. There were already about 500 nations there. Uh, My degree was in Native American studies. And so that was not the creation of a nation. It was the destruction of 500 nations, near destruction, many still exist, by a new white-led nation. And they justified it by saying, well, it's God who wants us to do that. And you can go back and back to the doctrine of discovery all the way to Constantine. But I think that there's that that's why it's so hard to combat. There isn't that one clear moment that we can point to and refute and say, oh, do you understand why this moment in history is bad? If you understand why that moment's bad, you, you the rest will fall away and you can you can back off from where that moment led led it. You know, it's so ingrained along the way, especially in our politics. In more recent decades, I think unfortunately, our politics has started to shape our faith in a lot of ways instead of the other way around, which is how it should be. And Christian nationalism has long harmed our country, and now it's starting to harm the church as well. And a lot of that, I don't know if that's fear of how rapidly our country is changing demographically and technologically, you know, with computers and artificial intelligence, but also the makeup of who we are changing faster than our minds can comprehend and our laws can catch up with. That's that's scary. It's legitimately scary. And when we're afraid, we try to protect the old ways. We get defensive. Um, And that leads to xenophobic policies and other harmful policies, us versus them fascist politics. But whatever it may be, we're certainly seeing a very different iteration of things in the post-Obama world and, and also the post-COVID world. But uh, things like no longer having a peaceful transfer of presidential power and with it being fueled by religion, by religious rallies, by divine rhetoric and prayers, that's new and that's scary. Yeah, I'm I'm curious on on your, <clears throat> I don't know, your, your thoughts of, for the future, uh, because when we had... We had Tim Alberta on. He he has a new book out, uh, which is a phenomenal book, The Kingdom, the Power, and the Glory. Um, you know, we we had asked him about hope, and and he and he referenced, you know, kind of the um, the gosh, I'm I'm gonna forget the name, but but basically he was like the children of the moral majority. You know, um, give him hope, <laughs> and and he and he talked about how, you know. Folks that talk about politics today, younger, younger folks uh, tend to internalize um, sort of their relationship uh, with others in the church and try to like make those changes sort of within the church versus, you know, outside the church. So instead of like using laws um, to legislate morality, they tend to, uh, you know, use relationships um, to, to change behavior. So I, I'd love to kind of, I don't know, get your, get, get a hopeful message <laughs> about the things that maybe you've seen some of your activism, you know, wh- what are some of those stories that, that help, that, that help drive you to keep doing what you're doing? Cause I mean, I, I could imagine if you're living and breathing in this world every day, 
um, there's probably more losses than there are wins. Yeah. Nothing is final. The losses aren't final. The wins aren't final. The church is 2,000 years old. We're going to be around another 2,000. God is infinite, you know, backwards in time, forwards in time. We have, at the end of the day, we have the hope of the resurrection. Death is never final. Death never gets the final word. The powers and principalities that tried to keep Jesus down and put him in the ground didn't win. They didn't get the final word. We are an Easter people. And if death and the Roman Empire couldn't win, what else can? So we always have the hope of the resurrection. And I get it. That doesn't always feel tangible day to day. So I remind myself that you can't have Easter Sunday without having Good Friday. That's something I first heard in a sermon as, as a kid and mattered to me a lot during my first major breakup. Uh, so it matters in every every element of life, the politics, the COVID, the fascism, but the divorces, the breakups, the, the cancer, the hunger, the lost jobs. There's always Good Friday before there's Easter Sunday. And Easter Sunday doesn't always take three days to come. Sometimes it's a lot longer, but but it does come. So cling to that hope of the resurrection. Uh, you know, to your question about are there specific things that give me hope, I'll point to a couple. Youth are one of them. I mean, man, looking at the youth leadership today, I hope that millennials and, and Gen Xers never try to squelch those voices, that we always remember what it was like when we were squelched or told, wait your turn, wait decades more for your turn. Martin Luther King was in his late 30s when he was assassinated. That was the pinnacle of his career. You know, he was working really hard in his 20s, really fast to get there. He was worth listening to in his 20s. Jesus was assassinated at 33, uh, crucified at 33, started his teaching at 30, doing some pretty cool stuff in his 20s to be that vocal at 30. So let's listen to the youth leaders. They're doing great stuff. I love the example you just shared about focusing on relationships rather than laws, because it's relationships that change the laws. Right when when so many laws started changing to allow same sex marriage, regardless of what you think the church should be doing, the law changed because people realized I know gay people, and I shouldn't. And and people realized it was that it gets better movement and the relationships and the reminder also of suicide statistics that these laws cause depression that leads people to die. These are people I know. I don't want them to die. It was the relationships that changed the law. So even if you're going to use the law as a tool, it starts with those relationships. It's what the disciples did. It's what we should be doing. So youth activists give me hope. My daughter gives me hope. The giggles, the joy. Little kids have always been that way. Parenting is tough. How do you find the balance between, you know, how do you just get out <laughs> rushing the joy? Yeah, man. But you know, taking joy in that joy, especially here at Christmas time, which Christmas, that, that's going to be my my last example. I know I'm, I, my answers are getting longer <laughs> as we go here. but uh it's fine. I'm a Christmas nut, uh, you know, in a secular and religious Christmas, both, you know, give it, give it to me all starting the day after Thanksgiving. Let's have Christmas in July. I put those 24 hour radio stations on uh, with all the Christmas music. <laughs> Scrooge and the Grinch, they're fictional characters, I, but they're real. And I really hate the way that we use those words as insults. Don't be a Grinch. Don't be such a Scrooge. Man, I hope I'm a Scrooge. It was said that no one kept the spirit of Christmas alive better than him. And he was a better than a father to Tiny Tim. And he laughed at them when they laughed at him. I'm, I'm used to be able to quote that a lot better. But look at who Scrooge was at the end of the story. Look, look at who the Grinch was at the end of the story. Why are these the characters? What does it say about us that we don't want to let them have that transformation? Which looks a lot like the transformation of the prodigal son in the Bible, right? And sometimes that is real. I went to Belfast in Northern Ireland for New Year's Day uh, a few years back and pre-COVID, pre-Brexit. And I took this really cool walking tour with my wife of the neighborhoods that had been divided by the troubles, like where the troubles and all that sectarian violence was really based for, for its, its Belfast piece. And there was a wall, much like the Berlin Wall, down the middle of these neighborhoods. And the wall's still closed many times. You want to drive two blocks, you got to drive 20 miles to get around the end of the uh, wall. There are other times the gates are open. They're increasing when those gates are open. But one side was the the Protestant uh, Unionists. The other side was the Catholic Irish Republicans. Different use of the word Republican than we have in the States. And that was the heart of the violence, those neighborhoods fighting. Today, you can take this three-hour walking tour, an hour and a half on both sides. On the Protestant side, you're led by a former Protestant political prisoner 
on the Catholic side, you're led by a former Catholic Irish Republican political prisoner. They meet in the middle, they shake hands, they pal around, chum for 10 minutes, hand over the tour. And both of them are working for the same organization, working for peace, working with youth, working with churches. You know, it's a part-time job. They have other jobs as, as political organizers, as faith activists, as any number of things. But man, two of the guys, they have dozens of tour guides. One of them lost his grandfather in a bombing that another one of the tour guides' father did. It's like, hey, your father killed my grandfather. Why don't we shake hands and lead a tour together? And they're all working for peace. Uh, and it's even more important now, five years later, as violence is increasing in Ireland, uh, mainly from the far right, post-Brexit and, and, and all of that. The change is real. I mean, I the guys I talked to were legit murderers. One of them I said, I, I listened to his story and I grabbed him on the side and I said, hey, did faith play a role in your conversion? And he looked at me and said, how did you know? Well, because I'm a pastor and I heard that the words you were using, I recognized them for what they were. You didn't hide it the way you thought you did. But he, you know, he met Jesus in jail and he realized the, the way the politicians had been leading him astray towards violence away from peace. And he changed. Faith changed that man. It changed a lot of people. Others changed for other reasons, but the change was real. And so just as mm -hmm. death and violence didn't get the final word with Jesus, they didn't get the final word with these men in Belfast. They didn't get it with Scrooge and the Grinch. And they're not going to get it with Christofascism on January 6th. We are an Easter people. Hope scares those in power. They try to take away our hope. They, they try to have politics of fear instead of politics of love. So remember that to keep hope and keep love, because that's what changes things. Hope for the sake of hope. Dude, that's so good. I think you just gave me my sermon for this weekend. So I really appreciate you doing that. Um, it really saves me saves me some I time. I so. in the Grinch and every year. Take it, please. Do it. I, I love it, man. You know, and, and, and I do believe in transformation. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, man, I follow, uh, you know, I follow the guy I'm supposed to be following. He was murdered by um, the basically – Besides the Assyrian Empire, the paradigmatic empire that just about every Western country has at some level tried to, um, you know, fashion itself after and, and, and its influence goes even beyond that. An empire is built into the heart of people, I believe. And something happens in that corruption. I'm not exactly sure what it is. Be really interesting to study that and do some do some work in that area. But, you know, I... So I imagine myself, um, I, I like to do thought experiments and imagine myself in different eras of time. And I've asked several of our guests, there's one guy in particular that had written a book on the, um, the religious right, essentially that the religious left disappeared for a time or got kind of swallowed up and never disappeared, but got kind of swallowed up by the religious Right. And I asked him the question as a story and I was like, hey, you know, do you think that I would have acted differently? You know, I like to think that I would have been the guy that would have stood up when everyone else was booing, that I wouldn't have been the guy that that said, no, I'm for this person. I like to think that. But if I actually look back, and like go a few generations back. Racism was deep in the heart of my of my ancestors, right? Um, bitterness was deep in the heart of my ancestors. They were poor. And I keep going back and I keep going back. And I don't know how much I see a hero as much as I see just a normal person trying to figure out how to live with the cards that they've been dealt and try to understand the world that they had no choice in building. They're just born into it. And then they have to make their contribution and do the best they can. And let's be honest, a full collision sport of life. It's not easy. And depending on where you live, it's even harder. And I'd like to think that I'd be the guy that was like, not Barabbas, Jesus, let Jesus go. I don't want Barabbas. But likely I would have been right there 
chanting Barabbas. And I can tell you that right now, because when I was in college, I was I was still a Republican. I only voted Republican. And then I was at an Obama rally screaming, go Obama, go Obama, go Obama. And I was like with my buddy in it. And, and why? Because everyone else was screaming it because the the feeling and the energy and the culture and the crowd got a hold of me, but there are obviously there are a few people that stand up. And my question is what is the role of leaders yeah. who stand up in this time? <laughs> What's your call to conservative leaders like me, like the people that I run in circles with evangel, you know, what, what, what's your call to those leaders right now in this moment is this a crucial moment is this like a pivotal moment where we have to step up right now or we're going to be remembered as history as 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 being on the wrong side what 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 is your call to leaders who man let's not just go with the culture let's not just go with what everyone's saying and doing but let's do something different what's the role of leadership in this in this transformation it's such a great question, and I'll be honest, not one I've thought a whole, whole lot about. Um, I, you know, as you were talking about, I'd probably be just an ordinary guy in past times. Where my mind went was, that's who followed Jesus around. Fishermen, tax collectors, yes, prostitutes, uh, other women who weren't prostitutes, yeah. but we can with that's them. Uh, that's exactly who Jesus came to and talked about. This is how you love your neighbor. And this is this is pick up your cross and follow me. Um, so, so those lessons are for everyone and, and the need to focus on others rather than ourselves is for everyone. That's why Christianity is so hard. We want to just do the best we can for our family. When Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead. Don't worry about your dad. Follow me. It, everything. Christianity changes everything. Everything we think we know about how we're supposed to live at the top for leaders, but but for all of us, it's just completely radical. And I'm failing to live into that, but that's okay because all two billion of Christians are. We we try a, a new every day. You know who else though was an ordinary folk? Were the folks Jesus said, "Don't follow me." I've already got these twelve behind me and these two hundred off to the side and this big crowd. Uh, be healed. Go home. Don't tell anyone. Or you just stay here and keep working on it. Um, you know, there were a number of times where people asked, can I follow you? And, and Jesus said, no, and those were ordinary folks too. We well, didn't say, don't follow me, F physically don't follow me, but do follow me where you are. And so I think for all of us yearning to be leaders, I'm in middle age, I'm starting to have that, oh gosh, I was a gifted child. Gifted means I was going to be a lot of things and I'm not, you know, we, we all hit that. Um, but we are where God wants us to be in this moment. Uh, God can pull us somewhere else later, but who is God calling me to be right now where I am? And I think that's true for everyone. Leaders, pe people in the pulpits, people in the pews, people in the White House, people who want to be in the White House, people who have a White House and don't ever want to leave that picket fence out front. Um, it it's the same call to just love our neighbors the best we can with what we have. Maybe you have more, maybe you have less. If you have less, give the widow's might. If you have more, don't let it go to your head. You know, that that actually, that, that brings something to mind. Um, I'll say this about leaders. This is something I was taught in seminary and, and as a hospital chaplain and, and pastor, and I found it to be very true. We tend to not realize the power we have. Pastors are entrusted with secrets. Maybe somebody even didn't say, pastor, this is a secret. Please don't tell anyone. They, they just sort of naturally assume the pastor would keep something personal, personal. And then the pastor accidentally jokes about it later. And that person feels so betrayed and so wounded. Uh, or, or the pastor makes a flip blasphemous joke that they think is just lighthearted. Ha ha ha. But everyone thinks, oh my God, my faith. If, if you can say that, what does this mean for my faith? People look to us as pastors as the God people and we forget that. And that's true of politicians who maybe only have 20 minutes to discuss a certain law because there's so many laws and so many things to get through today. And yet that law that you're taking 20 minutes to decide how to vote uh, or just assigning to your most junior staffer is going to affect millions of people in possibly deep ways. Maybe it's going to keep someone from going to college or allow new people to go to college and change their families forever. And yet you fall into your ideology. You only use 20 minutes. Don't give it the deep thought it deserves. Maybe we can't give it the deep thought it deserves. There are only so many hours in the day and so many people in the country. 
But just to remember and take seriously the fact that we all, especially at the top, make a difference in people's lives. And that is a holy obligation to take seriously, not to be bent for our own purposes, not to be bent for power, to to when we speak, speak carefully because people are listening and we sometimes we don't influence them. I mean, is anyone really going to remember this, the words of my sermon? Probably not, but they will remember how the sermon made them feel. Uh, what are we doing to spread love? And, and that's, I think, especially true of leaders who don't even realize that they're spreading that love or that fear. I'm kind of making this up as I go, but I think there's, I think there's something here. At the end of the day, it's all about love, and no matter what your station. You, you know, there's a um, one. There's one word that I've heard a lot, probably in the past four to six years, that I don't think I've heard um, uh, as much in the past or before then, and that's the word deconstruction. Yeah. And and when I when I talk to people that you know, say that they are deconstructing or they're, you know, going through deconstruction. Um, I'm always curious because like I came to the Christian faith much later in life, 2008. Um, so, and prior to that, I was an atheist. Um, I dabbled in Wiccan for a while. I mean, I was kind of all over the place. Um, so, so when people talk about deconstruction, it's, it's a real foreign concept for me. Cause like I wasn't raised in the church. But it seems like most of the people I speak with refer to their deconstruction to something that they've observed other Christians do or pastors preach or or whatever. So I'm I, I'd love to kind of get get your thoughts on the tie in if, if you think there's a tie in uh, to deconstruction and, you know, sort of our, our current political state. Yeah. I've known a number of folks who who. And I know a number of folks who are deconstructing and will say that about themselves or who have. I think deconstruction is is a good thing at, at all times for all things. None of us are who we were 20, 30 years ago, five years ago, nor should we be. I look back at some of the silly things I did in college or my mid-20s even last week, and, and I don't want to do that again. So to constantly be evaluating, reevaluating, learning, changing how many things did we hold so dear only to realize I only hold it dear because I learned it as a four-year-old from someone who learned it from, you know, their own third grade teacher who it actually wasn't that deep. It's just, we learned it at a formative age. That's good to examine. And for liberals, conservatives alike, there's a lot of backlash to deconstruction. And this ties it into the current moment. That backlash tends to be from people whose power is threatened by deconstruction. People who built their power on the, uh, things we've been taught or who even taught us those things for the sake of holding power. But I, I think, you know, Peter was deconstructing all the time. Jesus was constantly telling him, you got that wrong. Uh, Jesus never pushed Peter away. They kept working on it together. I I think um, it, it does come back to power, to the people in power discouraging deconstruction. The other tie-in to our current day Christian nationalism is probably the biggest threat to democracy, but also the church today. And one of the reasons it's such a big threat to the church, and there are many, is people look at Christianity and say, wait, that's who you guys are? The ones who want to burn down the Capitol and attack FBI offices and shoot up grocery stores over the great replacement conspiracy theories? I, I don't, that's Jesus. I don't want that Jesus. Wait, you're, you're trying to tell my cousin that his marriage isn't real and, and he needs to divorce his husband and not be able to, you know, have that a husband as the, as the emergency contact allowed into the ER? That's going to make them both so depressed. I, I, I don't want your Jesus if his goal is to depress my cousin. You know, we want love. And that is what Jesus is about. So, yet that when we start sounding more hateful or when we stop focusing on our neighbors and focus on ourselves, hey, I need my religious freedom. You should allow my my, my business to discriminate, and you should allow me to uh, have a church-run charter school, public school. You know, they're trying that in Oklahoma now. Suddenly, it's me, me, me instead of neighbor, neighbor, neighbor. And people say, I, I don't want anything to do with that. And so that can cause deconstruction. Deconstruction can lead folks towards other corners of the church. It can it can refresh, deepen. Uh, sharpen our relationship with Christ, or it can drive us away from the church. And it's because of the the way that faith is abused in the current political moment 
that all too often deconstruction becomes anti-faith instead of, you know, ex-Christian instead of ex-evangelical or a new form of evangelical. So deconstruction's always been around and it always will be, but it looks a certain way for more people because of the abuse of faith we see today. It doesn't have to be that way. Where Christian nationalism teaches bigotry, Jesus teaches love. Where Christian nationalism spreads QAnon misinformation, Jesus says, I am the truth and the truth shall set you free. And where Christian nationalism sets up political violence, Jesus was the Prince of Peace who said, put away the sword. Yeah, it's um, it's uh, such an interesting topic of how how are we going to move forward as a church and yeah offer a, you know I, I don't know if offer is the right word but introduce people to the Jesus that we know who was not judgmental um except towards those who were uber religious and put religious prescriptions in front of people such as Sabbath, such as clean and unclean, such as any number of the issues, the divorce issues, right? Where he, where he specifically addresses the hardness of the hearts that were in, and not only those that Mo, that that Moses spoke to, but but his contemporaries. And I I often wonder. And and I don't know. I don't know if I'm. I just often wonder: Would Jesus attend a same-sex marriage? I, I often wonder that. I often ask myself that, and I often think about that. And 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 this isn't to get into that because we don't have time at all yeah. to yeah. to give any kind of fair, um, you know, treatment of either side of that issue to give it a fair treatment. But I, but I wonder because, because I think that's an interesting question because no matter where you are, no matter where you fall inside of that, that question is going to challenge you because I think that, uh, I think that those that would think that Jesus may have no problem, they might have a different conversation with Jesus. Who knows? And those who think that Jesus would never do it, man, we might be super surprised by what Jesus would do and what he wouldn't do. And we don't get to say what he would do and what he wouldn't do. Now, he never had an opportunity. He was not there. So we don't know what he would have done. We're only left to conjecture and to, and to, and to go based off of what we have. But it's such an important question. Because how did Jesus treat the people who were not like him? He, 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 he had his greatest incendiary comments against the religious elite. Mm-hmm. His, his greatest criticisms. And I think he would do the same today. And so okay. I do agree with you. I agree that judgment begins in the house of God. And I begin that, I, 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 I think that you're right, that, you know, we are seeing the results of, of idolatry, of, of, the, of the idolatry of ultra patriotism that has taken nation and put it above even our commitment to Christ even our commitment to his teachings to do them. And so I think it's powerful and I love the work that you're doing and how can people, and you're welcome to respond to anything I just said, but, but also just my question, this is the last question they'll ask is how can people uh, keep up with your work, get connected with you, get involved with, um, you know, with the initiatives and projects that you have coming in the future. Oh, that's always my favorite question. And my gosh, I wish we had time to unpack all that and respond and discuss. And, and, and you know, would Jesus attend uh, a same-sex wedding is a very different question, too, than would Jesus perform it or bless it? Because I think that's you can a very attend different a wedding question, without, too. Yeah, you can attend a wedding without supporting, I think these people should never get married, but I love them and I'm going to be there. Or I think they should. You know, it's, it's, uh, and yet we try to take all these complexities and boil them down. Uh, people yes. should know Faithful America is progressive, you know, because that's where our faith leads us. That's that's human language, not kingdom language. But we we map onto what we would call liberal or progressive in the society, theologically most of the times, as well as politically. So we we work for uh, 
LGBTQ equality in the church as well as within politics. That's who we are. And those are different things. The argument for one is different than the argument for the other. So should I, I have... I have relatives who say, oh, man, gay folks are going to hell, but it's not Uncle Sam's job to stop them, and they'll vote Democrat every time. <laughs> and I very much disagree with that. I think it's not Uncle Sam's job to stop them, and I don't think that's sinful. <laughs> but anyway, uh, faithfulamerica.org, sign a petition, make a donation. I'll say, you know, if you Google us, you're going to find lies from the Catholic League and others, this right-wing group that were funded by billionaires actually – we're entirely grassroots driven. Every single, no foundation money at this time, no PAC money, uh, no billionaire donors. Average gift is $39 from the email list. And I'm not asking folks to donate, but please donate. But what I'm really saying <laughs> is that you are joining a grassroots group of folks who are trying to make a difference. The easiest thing to do is to sign a petition uh, that you'll find at faithfulamerica.org. Our, our 10 most recent are always there. But you can also just put in your, your email address and your zip code, and we'll send you mostly petitions, uh, occasionally webinars that we're hosting. If you sign petitions, you're more likely to also then get call alerts or next steps on those campaigns. And we'll work together to make a difference. Let me let me finish with two thoughts because we've talked about so much. One, I, it's so important to remember that even if Christian nationalism is not Christian, and I don't think it is, Christian nationalist individuals are Christian. We don't question anybody's faith. I mean, like Tony Perkins and others have questioned mine. Whenever they talk about us, we'll get several hundred nasty emails that tell us we're the spawn of Satan, we're lying, we're not Christian. I'm not going to question mm. anybody's faith that same way. I don't know anybody's heart or their relationship with God. If you tell me you're Christian, I believe you. Of course, that makes it all the easier to say it's as your brother or your sister in Christ that I want you to come back to faith, hope, and love and not political violence. You know, we're speaking to our sisters and brothers in, in Christ here. But but it's not about the people. It's about the political ideology. We're not fighting people. We're loving people. You know, we we yell about, I mentioned Franklin Grant, Tony Perkins, and Michael Flynn a lot, but also Donald Trump, Marjorie Taylor Greene. We've literally got a website, AmericanFalseProphets.org, where every year we put out a list of false prophets in both politics and the church. So yes, we name names and we talk tough about those leaders who we think are corrupting the faith and corrupting people. But the things I say about Trump, I don't say about Trump voters, you know, folks who don't have that level of power, who... Uh, you know, who have fallen under the influence or living in these OAN Newsmax bubbles that are, you know, not even Fox bubbles anymore. We, we've got to break bread with one another. We're going to keep living with one another for decades and decades to come. So lead with love, lead with relationships. Don't vilify other people. You know, listen, how is this conversation going to make the other person feel? How's it going to make you feel? Because we're going to remember that and be a lot more likely to have a second conversation based on those feelings than we are our words. And folks on the other side can say that about us as well. You know, the whole goal is to figure out how to love one another. And that that's not going to happen if we keep trying to vilify each other, either with the law or with our daily behavior. And I want to finish on a kind of a fun note. Because, man, Josh, you were just talking about Barabbas, right? I thought you were going to go towards the disciples and you went to Barabbas. And that reminded me of one of my favorite songwriters, this guy named Jason Eady, E-A-D-Y, uh, in Texas and Oklahoma, in the red dirt country scene down that way, which is some of my favorite music. And he's got this song called Barabbas that also ties into what we were talking about earlier about change is real, change away from Christian nationalism, change away from hard times, whatever it may be. And I just got to read, I heard the judge ask the jury, which one's the one to go? And I heard him say my name and why I'll never know. They unchained my feet. They unshackled my hands and they let me go instead of that innocent man. And the chorus, and I'm trying real hard not to sing here. I've got a second chance. I'm going to make it count. Make my way out west, maybe head down south. Live a life of a pardoned man, believing in things I don't understand. And it goes mm. on, the verse is deeper, but, um, you know, there's so, the Bible is short. They didn't have that much, you know, papyrus. They, they didn't have that much <laughs> yeah, They don't totally. unpack it the way we can unpack Stuff's it. It's expensive, it. man. Yeah, right? <laughs> there's so much more. Just as every person we meet has stuff going on we don't know about that led them to where they are today. There's so much more in every Bible story. And it, it's fun to think what more was here that Luke didn't have the time to write about. Uh, but imagine if that was Barabbas who saw them free him instead of Jesus. You know, Barabbas is Jesus, as we know him, was Jesus bar Joseph. 
Barabbas' first name, other sources tell us, was actually Jesus Barabbas. His father was Abbas. Jesus, son of Joseph. Jesus Barabbas. Jesus Bar Joseph. Jesus, son of Abbas. Jesus Barabbas. Sorry. Both Jesuses. And uh, imagine if he was led to change just like the prodigal son. What does mm. that mean for us? Like, Faithful America, our motto is love thy neighbor, no exceptions. That means LGBTQ folks. That means people of different races, of every race, of every gender. It also means Donald Trump and Joe Biden and the people who voted for the, the guy you didn't vote for. Yeah. Um, Let's let's never forget that. That's mm. so good. Well, what very well said, Reverend. Thank you so much for yeah, coming on you. the show, and to all of our viewers and listeners, this has been Reverend Nathan Impsale. That I said that right, Impsale, 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 Reverend Nathan Impsale. Um, and it's been such a joy to talk with you. And for our listeners and viewers, thank you. God bless you. And until we meet again, keep your conversations not left or right, but up. God bless, guys. Have a great day. Merry Christmas. Thanks. Merry Christmas. Thanks.